Thor, welcome once again to Counting Countries. Uh, I've lost track of uh, the number of appearances so far, but I am glad to have you back. It is uh, early July. We spoke last in mid-December when you're in Hong Kong. So I'm looking to forward to catching up over the last six months or so. So we all know who you are, but just uh, to dot our I's, cross our T's, introduce yourself and tell us in one sentence what the mission is. Hmm. <laughs> Hello again, Rick, and thank you for once again inviting me on Counting Countries, Rick Kassarian's World <laughs> Master Podcast. Um, I'm going to every single country in the world in an unbroken journey completely without flying. And without ever going home. Yeah, that's the unbroken journey part. It's built into okay. that one sentence. Okay, you're, you're better at it than me. So, and I really do want to say, I, I do want to say thank you to you because, yeah, I mean, obviously uh, time is our most valuable asset and I do appreciate you doing these check-in conversations with me and, you know, I feel like I'm doing something worthwhile by, you know, making a documentation of the uh, the last grouping of countries. So just a reminder, um, I believe you were country 197. And now, yes. Yep. Correct. So in New Zealand, uh, one, uh, country 197, and we've got some challenging countries left. Tonga, Samoa, uh, Tuvalu, Vanuatu, four tough ones in the Pacific. Then you'll be heading west to Sri Lanka, and the Maldives, and then finally home. So let's go back in our little time machine, Thor. We are mm. back mid-December. You were in Hong Kong. Uh, I think I was actually in Boston um, having this conversation with you, and I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to mince any words. I was, I was a little concerned after our conversation or, or during our conversation you were in a dark place and from my perspective, a place that is 100% reasonable based upon what you were putting yourself through. So how many days uh, you, you ended up eventually getting on a cargo ship PIL and you made your way out of Hong Kong to Palau. So let's go back in time and what was the big challenge from getting from Hong Kong to Palau back in uh, December or January? Yeah, um, well, we have a global pandemic, which is still <laughs> going on. And, and, and while I'm from Denmark and Denmark has long since moved beyond the pandemic and are dealing with more, I shouldn't say more pressing uh, issues, but but other, other issues. It, it seems to have the COVID-19 virus under control in Denmark and healthcare can deal with it. In this, this part of the world where I am now in the South Pacific, um, it's still very much pandemic time. Um, several of the countries I still need to go to or remain to have their borders closed uh, due to the pandemic and, uh, and traveling without flying uh, is incredibly difficult um, due to COVID-19 restrictions. So back in December, I had been stuck in Hong Kong for just about two years. And, uh, and I've been wanting to go home since 2015. And I've just been struggling, pushing, thinking, you know, if I just hold out six more months, then we'll get across this hurdle and it'll get easier and it will get done and another two or three months, and another five months, and another six months, and what the, and then the pandemic hit. And that was just a nightmare for me. Uh, I'm, I'm getting older, friends and family are getting older. This was never supposed to take as long as, as it has. It's becoming a much larger investment uh, on, on my account. And that pandemic just never gave me a break. It, uh, mm. Two months, three months, four months, five months, and then two years of holding out and, and, and wondering 
should I put a, a date somewhere out there in the future and say, if nothing's changed by that date, then I'm going to cut it loose and go home and, and call it quits. Um, but there was this opening. It looked like Palau was being progressive. It looked like I might have the right network that I could reach out to people. It looked like I had the support I needed. It took about six months to get in place. I mean, six months to get in place that I could come on board that container ship and uh, and have the blessings of Palau to enter Palau as well. And um, every time within those six months, it looked like, okay, now we're ready. It would fall apart. Something would change. Uh, a new variant of the, the virus, uh, regulations, a new minister, a uh, new caution from the shipping companies. After six months, got on this ship and went across to Palau and then... They quarantined me in, in Palau. Um, so, so uh, okay, let me jump in here, Thor. Yeah. So six months of grinding away, waiting for the wind to blow in the correct direction. So I, I want to know that feeling. I don't know if there was a literal gangplank, but when you were dropped off at the harbor and you're walking on to the Kota Ratna, I mean, is there a feeling of exhilaration, a feeling of victory, or are you just so jaded? I, I mean, what's that feeling like getting on that ship? That was great. That was, uh, I, I really love any kind of real progress that I see within this project. It's such a huge victory every time there is this progress. And it has been like that for, for quite some time. It's It's been complex. Uh, a great deal of the past almost nine years has been uh, complex, difficult, and and I often rely on on people. There is there are many things that I simply just can't do on my own. Um, I I need people to step in and say we want to help and we want to assist. And if I cannot secure that kind of support, then I I get stuck and uh, hmm. there's no light at the end of the tunnel. So getting on that ship was definite progress. That ship was. It was the first time I was leaving Hong Kong in, mm. in two years. I, 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 came to I believe Kong the number days. is 708 days you were <laughs> in Hong Kong. And yeah, I, to I put want that in perspective, I came to Hong Kong for four days, right? So from four days to 700 and, <laughs> and, and change. Yeah, and, I wanna, feeling. and I want to touch on something you just, you pointed out. It's, you know the the network the power of the network so when you were negotiating your uh travels to palau i mean i th i think your plight was brought to the attention of the president of palau or at least some ministers mm -hmm. who were getting involved and i mean i think that's due to your presence on social media your presence in the media and again uh you're saying is uh well, I'm, I'm going to screw it up, but a friend is a a stranger is a friend that you haven't met yet. So, touch touch up touch upon how the power of the network, and even though Palau is a country of whatever it is, twenty thousand, the president's still the president or the minister. W walk me through that part of the conversation and how you're able to leverage that. Yeah, so you're right. My social media presence is 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 growing, and uh, that that branches out and. And there was this guy, Roel, R-O-E-L, uh, who's Dutch and based in 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 Palau. And, and he sort of arrived in Palau right around when the pandemic broke out. And he felt that he had a similar situation, that he was in Palau and couldn't really go anywhere. And I was in Hong Kong and couldn't really go anywhere. He'd been following my weekly blog and, and found that interesting. And um, he'd been networking while in Palau. And... As you mentioned, it's not a, a, a big population. Um, it's a beautiful country and people are nice enough, but not, not many people. And uh, it doesn't take a lot of networking to get high up the ranks in, in Palau. And he was friendly with the president's advisor and had met the president a few times and were able to reach the uh, health ministry and, and a variety of different ministers. That So, yeah. That's sort of how I, I, I got into that network. 
Yeah. Uh, well, thanks to Roll, who was mentioned on previous podcast as well. So it sounds like he really uh, rose to the occasion to help out the saga. I think there's also another monkey wrench. Um, I think the boat stopped in Guam before Palau, and there was a challenge there as well. Oh, that, yeah. So the the U.S. is an amazing country for about six billion different reasons. Uh, it's also a very strict and and dominant country. And Guam and Saipan are U.S. territories, and the U.S. is so strict that if you are a foreigner on board, in this case a container ship passing through the maritime borders just in the waters around surrounding Guam or Saipan, not leaving the ship, you still need to have an American visa. Um, and I do. So that's fortunate enough. But now it was pandemic times as well. And then there were more regulations and more. there was more red tape. And initially, they weren't sure if they were going to allow me to be on that ship. It just seemed way too suspicious uh, why there would be a passenger on board the ship in U.S. territory. There are also U.S. Uh, and naval vessels and this kind of stuff in the territory as well. So, But also just people paragliding and whatnot. Um, yeah, so, so it ended up going all the way to Washington. And then a decision was made in Washington that, yes, I could be on board the ship without leaving the ship <laughs> mm. in U.S. territory. Yeah. yeah. That, I, that I mean, th- th- thank God, obviously, you, you got the affirmation that it was okay. But, uh, I mean, the the stress and tension that must have caused you for something that seems insane, that you can't be on a boat floating by Guam or Saipan. So glad glad that worked out. So I think you arrived to Palau January 19th, 2022, country 195, and that was your first new country in almost two years. Um, Victory, awesome country, beautiful. But as soon as you got off the boat, I think you got a swift kick to the shins. Um, I, I think that was about two weeks on the boat to get there. So I'm sure you were excited to get off there and explore this truly, truly beautiful island. Um, you get off the boat, what happens? And where did you end up spending your first eight days or so? Yeah, yeah, I got <laughs> got off the ship and... Uh... I already had an agreement with the same shipping company, Pacific International Lines, PIL, that um, they would take me back to Hong Kong with the next ship, which would arrive two weeks later. So I knew I had this two-week window in Palau. I'd also, through uh, communication with the Palau's government and their health ministry, sorted out that I did not need to quarantine as long as I had, uh, as long as the sea voyage would be more than more than 14 days and I tested negative before coming on the ship and uh, tested negative before leaving the ship. And then when I arrived, it was all this, like this very classical island feeling with a lot of people and everything moves a little bit slow and you have different people staring at me. And and some of them were with visors and masks and uh, some didn't come out of their cars and this kind of stuff. And eventually um, I was informed what was going to happen. It took a bit of time and there was a little bit of confusion and there, there were like a lot of chefs uh, on, on, the, on the key. And then they put me in a car and then they drove me 200 meters uh, in this car after waiting for 20, 25 minutes. They drove me 200 meters to a hotel uh, that they chose um, and uh, I was put into a room and told not to leave. And uh, then slowly I was being informed that I was now quarantined for the entirety of the 14 days. And uh, yeah, so I thought this must surely be a mistake. And I was reaching out to the people that I could and thought, you know, I don't mind one or two days of caution. And 